Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick uh, talking today with Gabe Ferguson, and we're right in the middle of draft season today looking at the cornerbacks. Gabe, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Ken. Thanks for having me on the show again. Always a pleasure. You're one of our favorite guests. You know that. Uh, let's uh, And also on the situ- Ravens Situation Room, so we're going to talk about that, at Gabe Fergie on Twitter, correct? That's correct. Yeah, we um, we actually just recorded a pre-draft podcast yesterday. We're looking at the offensive side of the ball, some of the positions of need, um, kind of taking a look at the roster and, and the number of players that might actually make it onto the roster because there's not a whole lot of roster room, I don't think. It is a, it's a, a big air, a constraint in their entire system is how many total roster spots they have. Jordan made that point when he was on for the running back show, and I completely agree. There are positions where the Ravens have some spots on the 53, outside linebacker being a key one that they'll find space for. But a lot of other positions, offensive line, it's harder to fit that guy on because you have to kick somebody off. Uh, you know, cornerback is another good one. We're going to talk about that tonight. But let's, let's start with the Ravens' situation at cornerback because ooh, we look at this as a very deep cornerback group. They signed Jimmy Smith for an extra year. They still have Marcus Peters. They still have Marlon Humphrey. Anthony Averett is coming into year four now. Uh, it's a very good long set of corners. And yet, the Ravens have found a way to find the bottom of their depth chart each of the last few years. Yeah, for some reason, the Ravens just always seem to get struck at the cornerback position with the injury bug. And I mean, dating back to, I mean, thinking back to 2014, for instance, that was a really good Ravens team. And they were looking at practice squad players that they were starting. And, you know, I think they've definitely tried to address that more recently with just keeping on drafting corners over and over again. Even, you know, we saw Marlon Humphrey get drafted when I, I don't think a lot of people thought he, it was a need. Um, but, you know, he, that, was a, that was a great find. And I don't know if this is a class where you would take someone in the first round, but, you know, we've been surprised by where the Ravens go in the, in the draft before. And it might not be something that's completely outside of the, the realm of possibility. Yeah, I mean, I think if they, I can think of two corners in particular, if they drop to the Ravens at 27, there's no way they don't take them with the first pick. And, and I'm honestly of the opinion that given the Ravens roster composition, I, I don't think Marcus Peters uh, will be with the Ravens for too much longer. He certainly is, is going to be here for this year. Next year, we don't know. You know, maybe, maybe their restructuring's done and whatnot. Um, Anthony Averett may be gone after this year because he's coming into his fourth season. He's a, he's a guy I like. He's a guy I think makes a lot of sense to re-sign for a smaller, longer team deal right now. You know, three years, six million if he'd go for that. Something guarantees his financial future, but also puts the Ravens in a good spot for a couple more years. Uh, I think there's, they, they have players that, that would fall into that category. Humphrey's not going anywhere, so we're, we're, we're comfortable with that. Jimmy Smith's near the end of the line. Long corner looks like a really big need on this Ravens team to me. It looks like this is the year to address it, not to wait till it's actually... A problem that's a whole. Yeah, because I mean, and you mentioned it. And I, I don't know if you mentioned Tavon Young either, but no. you know he hasn't really been able to stay on the field when when the Ravens have wanted him to be on the field. And I think his contract is if it's not up after this year; it's up after the next one. So he's definitely at the end of his of his contract as well. Right. So he's he's actually really playing for. 2022 and 2021 because he took a reduced salary this year, but his salary for next year wasn't affected on the contract. But it being the last year of his contract, um, he'll almost certainly be cut if he doesn't have a comeback year this year. So he'll, he's playing for that. And, you know, I think most people would agree the slot is the place where the Ravens need another guy they can actually really rely on more than outside. But that's a 2021 only view. It's not a long term view, in my opinion. I think they pretty much need another young cornerback period of some quality out of this draft. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And like you said, a couple of players who are going to be free agents, you know, a couple of players who are, haven't really shown that they might not stick around. Like, I mean, I'm thinking about um, Iman uh, Marshall Mm -hmm. and he's, he hasn't been on the field either. He's been hurt. So like Mm -hmm. maybe you have someone who could be a good player there, but you don't know. And I think he's probably a fringe roster guy at this point. Just yes. because you don't you don't know if he's going to be able to contribute or not. 
Yeah, I, I would agree entirely. I think I think his his spot's actually at risk. Okay, so how we've been doing this with the other shows is going through with a top ten list. I know you didn't do it exactly that way, but maybe you can start that way at the beginning, and we can kind of go down. So you're the guest. We'll start with your number one guy. If I have a different guy, I'll respond with that. So I, I think the number one guy for me has to be Patrick Sertan. Um, you know, he comes from Alabama. They know how to teach their defensive backs. Obviously, Marlon Humphrey was a Bama cornerback. He's been great for the Ravens. Um, you know, he has the size. He has the athleticism. He has kind of the ability to play in a man or in a zone. He has a lot of flexibility with him. Um, he might not have, like, the elite top-end speed or the elite length and size you want at a cornerback, but he's just underneath those kind of benchmarks. And I think all around he's, you know, he's a, to me, a top 10 player in this class. Everything is so right about Patrick Sertain that I didn't want to really pick on anything. I think the speed concerns are frankly overblown, especially when you watch him on tape. There's just nothing wrong with the guy in terms of the, the actual results. He has a very low target percentage, you know, if you look at the top NFL ready corners, if you're targeted 12% of the time, that's, that's a lot. If, if you're, if you're in the draft expecting to be drafted and you played anywhere and you were drafted 12% of the time, that's a lot. Now the SEC's a great conference, lots of passing. Everybody's got good receivers. Everybody's got good cornerbacks at multiple positions. So a, a, a player like him is going to be targeted more, but he still had a very low target percentage this year. And I didn't actually record it here. Um, he, he's had good passer ratings for three years. He's played a ton at Alabama. Nothing left to prove at the college level. He's an obvious day one starter to me. Uh, you know, the other thing that I'll say about him is he really has to have a great work ethic to maintain that quality of play for multiple years at such a high level. And, and there are a couple cornerbacks in this class, and they're in the high rounds, who I think displayed that same uh, trait. But uh, he's my number one guy as well, and I expect him to be gone in the top 12 picks. If, if he were to last until 27, the Ravens won't hesitate. They'd take him in a heartbeat. They wouldn't, they wouldn't mess around. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Anytime someone who's that talented falls, you know, to a place where you shouldn't be, you, you can't pass on that. And, you know, I don't think there's any chance that that would happen outside of some catastrophic injury or information that comes out right before the draft. But mm -hmm. um, even then, it, it's hard to pass on a talent like that. Mm -hmm. OK, well, he's my number one guy also. So let's move on to your number two guy. So the number two guy I have would probably be the consensus number two, I think, in J.C. Horn mm -hmm. um, out of. South Carolina, he's a little bit more of that prototypical size speed combination. Um, he kind of reminded me a little bit of Patrick um, Patterson um, coming out of, of college, just like that size and speed, the ability to play press man, to really be sticky at the line of scrimmage. Um, I think that that is his, his skill set, though. You want him in press coverage. Um, I don't know if he is going to be as good if you're asking him to play in, in kind of a zone coverage scheme. Yeah, he's certainly a pure outside guy at 6'1", 205. Um, I, I, I saw all of that in terms of the press coverage, but he, he has the whole Jimmy Smith kind of package or, you know, package that we liked out of Ike Taylor in the past is that he tries to disrupt the, the route, even though he really has some of that makeup speed that you could have. So he's up there. He tries to disrupt the route. He tries to use the boundary as the extra defender. He's very good at both. And yet he still has makeup speed. So it's really it's it's a wonderful package of assets. Uh, it, it, there's not a lot of differentiation between between him and uh, and Patrick Sertan. And I, I would say that either one of them at 27, I would love to get, and they'll both be on in the first 12. Yeah, I, I agree. I think they're both like in that top 10, top 12 range in, the, in this class. And I, I think teams cover the cornerback position too much to let them slide much further down the draft board. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have the same number two guy. Go to number three. Um, this might be pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so for me, it's, it's going to be, uh, ooh, so this, these two, these two are close, but I'm going to go with Greg Newsom, mm -hmm. um, out of Northwestern. And I, I really, really like watching him play. I think he's got that unique ability just to sit like in a wide receivers, like hip pocket. And he's very sticky in coverage. Um, he's got speed, he's got the ball skills. Um, he, he's definitely, I, I mean, he, he's not, he hasn't had that many interceptions, but he breaks up a lot of passes. So he has a great ability to break on the ball, which you really like to see from a cornerback. 
Yeah, he, he kind of he has elements of his game that remind me of Marcus Peters, not in terms of the baiting the quarterback component yet, which Peters is really special at. But he, he kind of has a good gambling sense, definitely breaks on the football from off coverage a lot. You know, at his size at 60192, he's not too small to play press man, but he's probably going to play a little bigger when he's in the NFL. He's at a speed level where he still can put on some weight. Um uh, it just doesn't really bother me because hey, you know he's playing where he's playing and um, at Northwestern, and he was tar- but he's targeted fifteen point two percent as a junior. That would be bad, except that the passer rating against him was thirty one point seven for the year. So I'm all of a sudden very unconcerned about it. Uh, lots of year by year improvement. In fact, the passer ratings went from one forty nine to eighty seven to thirty one point seven in his three years there at Northwestern. That's something I really like to see. And he's a guy that I look at as being a obvious work ethic guy to improve that much over that period. So uh, he may be a guy who's a lifer. And if you want that break on the ball and learn the ball skills and improve his game in multiple ways, he could become that Marcus Peters type who, uh, you know, outplays uh, declining speed as he moves along in his NFL career. Yeah, and I think with Newsom, one of the concerns has been his durability. Um, mm-hmm. He's been nicked up um, throughout his collegiate career. I don't know if he's played a full s- s- slate of game, um, but you know the, the skills are pretty apparent there. And and he's someone who I think will definitely also be a first round pick. He might be around when the Ravens pick. So there, there's an opportunity that he's someone who's there at 27, and I'm I'm, I'm not sure if if he's the level of talent that you're looking at for the Ravens, if that's something that you really want. Um, but depending on what the other options are on the board, depending on yeah. your trading options, I think it's something to consider. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not a pick that would upset me in any way if the Ravens took him. It's, it's, a, a, it's a, a pick that a lot of people would think is opposite need. Um, it would upset me if they pick a second round center in the first round. That would upset me. Picking a first round cornerback uh, at 27, that doesn't upset me at all. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, you're three for three so far. So go on with your fourth. So we, I think we were probably going to be four for four, but <laughs> maybe not. For me, it's Caleb Farley. Yep. Um, out of Virginia Tech. You know, he's another one of these kind of prototypical like size, speed. He's got all the length. He's got the coverage skills. Um, really good athleticism. You know, he opted out of the 2020 season, which, you know, there's a chance that you know. NFL team scouts will hold that against him. I'm not sure how that's going to work in, you know, in the, the draft room, war rooms, um, how that's stacked up. But, you know, in the season that he was playing, he really was impressive. He did turn a lot of um, pass breakups into interceptions. Um, I think he has really good ball skills. I think he has the whole package. Um, he has an injury that he had in the, in the season that he wasn't playing. I think back injury. So the medical is going to have to be something that checks mm-hmm. out for him. But, you know, if that looks good, I mean, going into this process, I think he was widely considered the number one back prospect. And mm-hmm. he kind of slid down a little bit because he took the year off because of the injury. Um, but that's the kind of talent you're potentially getting. Right. I, I, it's a lot to unpack there in what you said, because some great stuff here. But one thing I'd, I'd point out is the number of teams that say a 2020 opt out is not on my board or has dropped two rounds on my board or whatever, the Ravens will be licking their chops with every team that says something like that, because it's just, it's too constraining. It's too formulaic. They really, they're going to be able to discern who were the players. And I really hope that there's a lot of teams that are looking at opt-outs and saying, well, we just can't really consider that a guy anymore because we didn't even see him play. The medical is a more serious concern because that was a January injury, as I understand it, with the with the back. And uh, it kept him from his pro day workout. And it's the kind of thing that you do have questions about. So it may be that they want to talk to him, that they want to work him out, that they want to do other things before they draft him. And if Caleb Farley says basically he doesn't want to you know, work out four teams or do anything more than he did at his pro day uh, before the draft, then it may mean that, that he does his stock does drop away. But he's the number four guy for me. I, I, I don't think you can go wrong um, with him except for the medical. Uh, you look back to 2019, four interceptions on 50 targets and a 27 passer rating against. 
Uh, that's just absurdly good. Uh, talk about him moving to safety down the line. It's not out of the question at his size, but I also think a lot of those kind of projections are probably premature at this point. He's got all the speed necessary to play outside. He's really he doesn't have a problem with that unless the unless there's an issue with the back. And if there was an issue with the back, it'd keep him from safety too. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think that's the biggest question with him. I think he also had an ACL tear um, early in his collegiate career, so he has that on his medical as well. So there's definitely going to be teams having to do their due diligence on that side of things, but from a talent perspective, and if he's being pushed down the draft board to the late first round, that's someone that would be difficult to pass on. Right. I, I would agree. I, I think he it would upset me more if they took him instead of Newsom at 27. Both are available. I'll take Newsom, no, no doubt about it, given the, the, the lack of lack of questions. If if they were at 27, I'd really want them to try and trade down to get Farley. Even though I think he's a number one talent, I'd like to get them, you know, get him around number 40, because I think other teams might have the same kind of disconcerting feeling about, you know, what's going on with him medically. So anyway... Certainly a, a terrific talent, great developmental player. And the Ravens, by the way, as a team that does not need this player to play cornerback immediately, would be a perfect place for him to land. Think about these these guys who have a little bit of a question all the way down the cornerback list. The Ravens are a great place to play because they don't absolutely need the guy in 2021. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. You can you know, get back into the swing of things, the football shape. Obviously, we've talked about injuries before, so there's probably a chance that he's going to play a significant role, um, even if you know it's not someone. Even like even if somebody like Anthony Averett mm -hmm. went down, you know the Ravens play so much dime package, and then they play a lot of four, four cornerbacks, cornerbacks at time. Yeah, um, and and he's someone who could come in and be a really impactful player in that kind of kind of package. And you have such a strong and deep secondary that it would would be a real strength that you're adding strength to. And I think that's how you can really um, build a defense that can completely take away some of the you know, passing attacks we've seen become predominant in the NFL. Yeah, it's critical mass theory. So that's that's uh, I, I I don't disagree with it. And and the four corner dime is something, you know, I don't I don't talk about it all the time because I love the three safety dime as well. But the the teams that play ten personnel force you into a four corner dime, and the Ravens have more and more of those they may face. We may see it from Cincinnati this year. We're, we're, we we've always seen it from Pittsburgh. You know, have seen it in recent years from Pittsburgh. That's a, that, that's two awfully important games for which you really need to have four healthy cornerbacks you can count on. And really, a couple guys who can play in the slot, because a lot of it, a lot of it's depended on that. There's more teams like Kansas City that they don't necessarily, put, you know, show you four corners, but it's Kelsey, three wide receivers, and a running back, and you may as well think about playing a four corner dime with one of your guys being a big corner. So, I, I, you know, it's, there's a lot of teams where where that comes up. It's not just the Arizona Cardinals anymore who, who kind of force you into that defense. Okay, yeah. we're four for four so far. Who's number five on your list? So I don't know if we'll go five for five here, but we might. Um, for me, it's Elijah Molden. Um, he's a, really the slot cornerback mm -hmm. from, from the Washington Huskies. And he's, it's interesting when you have someone in the college level who plays mostly slot, because a lot of times you'll have someone outside cornerback in college. And then because of size limitations, they come in and tra transition to be a slot cornerback in the NFL. Molden played most of his snaps in slot in college. Right. And I think he played really well there. And he, he does the different jobs of the, the slot position well. You know, he, he can play in coverage, and he does a good job, I think, of, of covering the, the slot receiver. But he's also very uh, willing and eager to fill in the run game. Um, I think he's a good tackler. Um, he's very aggressive. Um, he can make, get to tackles for loss. Um, he's got good hands. He can, you know, he had some interceptions in his time as well. Um, I, I just think there's a lot to like from him, and it would be a natural transition directly into that role in the NFL for him. Now, there are things to like about Eric Molden, and I'm going to seem more polar in this description of him than I think I, I really feel, but I left him off my top 10 entirely. Now, he had, he had problems that I just couldn't overcome, and it starts with the 46240. Um, that's a level 
many linebackers are above. Like Chris Board, I'm sure, is better than a 462-40. Patrick Queen is much better than a 462-40. You know, he's got slot skills that I think are polished at a high level from playing there a lot uh, in his time at Washington. But he's not a special athlete for the position. And I'm afraid that that's really going to hurt him in the NFL. I think that he'll be targeted by NFL defensive coordinators. Uh, his target share is extremely low. Last year at 7.7%. And, and so he only allowed a handful of yards per game. It was about 16 yards per game. He only played four games this last year. But, but obviously other teams are respecting those highly polished skills. It's just the NFL is a different level. And he's going to be, I think, overmatched by a lot of the speed and a lot of the size at the next level. And, and I, I, while I... Would love to take a flyer on him if it's in the third or fourth round, maybe probably the fourth round. Uh, he's not a guy that I would take in the second round. I, I can understand where you're coming from, and and the speed um, thing is is a real that's a real concern. Um, and I think you kind of see it at times on the tape. He doesn't have you know that real recovery speed to follow someone mm-hmm. um, on like the on verticals. Um, he's definitely more of kind of your underneath player. I think does really good things in the short area, mm-hmm. um, but you don't you don't want him covering somebody um, downfield. I don't I don't think. The one thing I do consider as a possibility with him would be a transition to safety. Um, I th- I think he has some of the skills where he could be really good. Um, maybe even as like a Tyran Matthew kind of player. Um, he doesn't quite have that playmaking that level, but I think there's some of that in his game. Um, so. I think there could be potential as kind of like a, a nickel safety slash cornerback. You could put in the slot. You could drop cover. And or you like, can disguise your coverages and moving yeah. around. Yeah. So I, I kind of see that for him, but I'm not sure if that alone covers up for some of his issues. Yeah. It's, I, I, that would be an interesting way to use him. I, I honestly believe he's probably too small to be a safety. The year's of having Bob Sanders back there. And, and Bob Sanders was probably a little shorter and a little heavier than Eric Molden. Uh, you know, it just those days are gone. And Bob Sanders, when he played, got the crap beaten out of him. He couldn't stay on the field, even though he was great, uh, you know, just from, from, uh, from getting beat up. So I, I'm, I, I think Molden has to pretty much stay in the slot. Uh, it doesn't mean he couldn't be a very smart player there. And I may not be giving him the amount of credit for reading leverage off the line of scrimmage. So maybe he can really help you sort out a bunch of formations off the line of scrimmage so he's not the guy who ends up getting beat. Um, those are all positive qualities. And I could see, you know, you have him in there and, you know, he's maybe a guy you can rush the passer a little bit to or he's, a, you know, not afraid to tackle all of those elements. Maybe that's a positive you could take from it, but I just, I'm, I'm really concerned specifically about the coverage skills in his case. Cause he, um, he just has not been tested by the kind of size and speed he's going to face. Yeah, I completely agree with that. All right. So I didn't have the same number five guys. So I'll go with my number five guy is Eric Stokes of Georgia, 60194, 43440. Um, a lot of people say he doesn't play quite that fast. Um, but he allowed 16 yards per game in the SEC, a 44 passer rating this last year. He's a disrupting uh, press corner, so he really tries to disrupt routes. There's an element of gambler in him as a press guy that is different, not a gambler as a coverage guy. So he doesn't break on the football like Peters does, but he's more of a gambling press guy. Um, loves a lot of that. The rules in the NFL are different in terms of when you're allowed to bump a receiver. Uh, that's been cited as a, as a problem by some for him. Uh, the change of direction metrics that he has are kind of meh. I don't really notice a problem on tape, but you wouldn't notice it as much with an outside corner necessarily as you do with a slot corner where there's whip route after whip route being run against the guy. Um, I think he'll learn to play more with his speed and less with his physicality at the next level. And I think you're kind of making a bet that your coaches can get him to figure out the tells that a quarterback has and a receiver has, and not just to gamble physically play after play after play. Yeah. I, I think what you, what you said there at the end um, resonates with me because to me, he looked like someone who was very physically gifted, but was sometimes, like footwork wasn't there, like the the fluid, like kind of 
hip transition when going and dropping off in coverage. I didn't I didn't watch a lot of them um, because I didn't really see him as someone that was a great fit for what the Ravens do. But I I mean he has some physicality. Like I like the ability to kind of press. I think that's important, especially mm-hmm. for anybody the Ravens are going to be drafting at the cornerback position because that's something that they obviously do um, not all the time, but something that they their corners to be able to do. And I, I think Stokes can definitely fill that role. And, and he has, the, like, the blazing speed. Like, that is, I think, that, I mean, maybe he doesn't look like he's a 4-3 guy on film, but he's definitely fast. And I think that's that important for the cornerback, clearly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, one of the points I think we, we could agree on is that everybody after those top four guys, it's a big pile of they got some sort of limitation. And, and Stokes is certainly not without his limitations in terms of the way he plays, kind of being different from how he's built, which is a little odd. I, I just found of all the guys I had lower on my list here, I thought his problems were probably the most correctable. And we'll talk through the rest of them now as we, as we go through. But who's your number six guy? So I think the guy I would have next would be Asante Samuel Jr., um, who reminds me a lot of his father. <laughs> Just mm-hmm. in their play style, they, they, they kind of look the same on the field, same kind of build, uh, kind of like a wiry, smaller um, size. I think he's 5'10". Um, I, I think he's probably better suited as well in, in zone kind of scheme than he is in press man. Um, but he has speed. I, he's, he's definitely physical. He's willing to like come up and, and put, lay the lumber, so to speak. Um, and I think he's, you know, he's in a solid player. I, I had like a second round grade on him, so I think he's someone that you, you could potentially take. He's there for the Ravens drafting in the second round. Um, he, I think he can play in the slot. He has some of you know the quickness and the ability to like stick with receivers there. Um, I, I just wasn't sure if he's someone who can really be consistent um, and, and man coverage on the outside, and that's and that's something that um, I would probably prefer. In a cornerback, I was drafting early. And this is someone like like Molden that you want had. to know that they could do both. Yeah. Okay. And That's... you know, I kind of made it an exception for Molden because I thought he was just so good in, in what he was doing in the slot, and that's something that the Ravens really need. Um, but maybe that's looking too narrowly and 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 what um, the, what the team needs are, and not really the overall value. Of Right. I, I, I would definitely prefer Samuel in, in the slot over Molden. And he is, in fact, my, the next guy on my list as well. Uh, he's a little undersized to play on the outside. And, and now I think the 53rd percentile is where the sixth foot corner starts in the NFL right now. And it might be that changes every year. The corners get taller and taller. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there just aren't very many 5'8", five, 5'9", five, guys. So when the Steelers were drafting a bunch of 5'7", five, and 5'8", five, and 5'9", five, guys, you know, their own fans were looking at it and saying, what the hell? And, and except for some of them who were making excuses because they, they're Steelers fans. But the, but the, uh, it, it really didn't make a lot of sense relative to the trends in the NFL. And, and it, that's, that would be my concern is that his size is a little bit less. And it probably does make him a slot corner. I don't have a problem with that, though. And I think he'll be excellent. His, his uh, progress, also a great indicator of being a work ethic guy. Um, he does have a 13.9% career target share. So in the SEC, I'm sorry, in the ACC, because he plays Florida State, they've been trying to target him fairly regularly, which is, it's not a great indication, but then his, his uh, quarterback rating has gone from 109 to 75 to 46 in three years. So this is another guy who clearly is learning his craft, doing a good job with that. That kind of coachability, I think it can only you know, bear fruit in the NFL. I, 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 that's how I have to take it is whether it's coachability or ability to learn on their own, whichever it is. A uh, guy is probably a good film guy when I see that kind of improvement year over year. Um, the agility metrics and the obvious on-tape ability to read leverage is a great combination to have. When you see that in a player and you can look at him and he, he deals with the rip route pretty effectively. He doesn't get fooled by a double move automatically. He doesn't break on the receiver's first move and he has it kind of figured out. Um, when I see that and then I also so see really good agility numbers from a three cone uh, and, uh, and a shuttle, um, then I really like the guy in terms of, of, of what I have. I think if you can, you can have the agility metrics and not have any idea what's going on, with your opponent. But but if you have both, that's a really special thing. I think Asante Samuel is a guy who has it. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And I think in this in the second round, someone who is definitely on, on the radar, if he makes it that mm-hmm. far, I think he probably ends up going closer to the top end of the second round just based off of, I don't want to say name value, but I think the bloodlines matter to the NFL teams. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also think that he has, you know, the speed he has, you know, he was coming from a big time school and I think the, the production was good for him. And like you said, he improved um, during his time at FR State. So I think he's someone that you'd have to definitely strongly consider um, that second round. If, if the Ravens move down in the first round and instead of, instead of picking 27, which is something I kind of hope they, they do, they move down to say 50 in trying to pick up a couple of mid to late round picks, I mean, you know, be like maybe you get a three and a five out of that kind of a move. I'm not exactly sure what it would be, but let's say it's a three and a five. Um, would you be upset if they took uh, Asante Samuel at number 50, say, if he was their first pick and he's at number 50? Um, I don't think I'd be upset. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if it would be my ideal um, as your first overall player selected. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that there's definitely some value that he would bring um, to, the, to the team. As, as we discussed, there, there is a need a cornerback. So I, I think that I'd prefer maybe going in another direction, um, okay. but I, I wouldn't hate it. So, so let's, let me give you a real specific example. Let's say it's Creed Humphrey or him at number 50. Who would you take? So I was thinking offensive line would, would be my preference. Uh, in that kind of scenario. And I think Humphrey, I would prefer. Okay. I, I'd be okay with that too. I, I do think 50 is about the right range for Humphrey. And I think it would actually be a bargain to get Samuel at 50. Uh, but the need has to play some factor in your decision making. And I, I think I'd agree with the, with the judgment there. Okay. That was my number six guy. Or was it both of our number six guys? Both of our number six guys, right? Yeah, I think I had him at number five, and you had uh, Stokes at, at five. So uh, Stokes would have been six for me. You said Molden. Oh, Molden, Molden. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, okay. yeah. So they both were six. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you go ahead with your number seven guy. So since we already, we already talked about Stokes, um, I, I'm going to go a, a few spots down um, because this is someone who I probably have a little bit of a, a crush on, a draft crush, so to speak. Um, and that's um, another slot corner, and that's Aaron Robinson um, out of UCF. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he impressed at the Senior Bowl. I was, I was watching some of his, his reps and practice, and he had some nice um, play, I think, in the Senior Bowl. Um, he has good size. He's also a slot corner. I should preface that. He played mostly in the slot there for UCF, and he has more size in the slot cornerback than some of the other guys we talked about. So he's closer to six foot. But he still ran under a four four, so he has the speed and the size and the ability to play in the slot. I think that's an interesting combination that that you be adding with the Ravens. Yeah, I mean, I I don't have a problem with him. He is on my list. I've got him a little lower down. My issues. A couple things with him. First of all, I think he's more of a gambler in the slot and doesn't trust his speed enough and probably is not the great leverage reader that I would want in the slot, which that that may force him to the outside. Not that that would be terrible uh, because he has the size, I think, to still play outside. He's he's not tall, but he's but he's not really short for playing outside either. Um, He had a low target share in 2020, but it was with four TDs and no interceptions and 101 passing rating. It's just, that's just not ideal, and he's playing at Central Florida, so the, the rest of the competition level is not all at a particularly high level, so that has to concern me some. So I know there's guys who like him. I know there are people who who look at either Senior Bowl or other elements and, and, and like that. But I just I have some reservations about the guy, and I'm he, he's he just wouldn't be my top guy. I think he probably goes in the third round, but I'm but I'm not real excited about him. Yeah, I mean I think that's fair, and you know the, the stats definitely would be on your side for that. Um, I, I think that there's some traits there that are are unique, and that's I'm not saying he's necessarily my seventh cornerback, um, but I, I think he's someone that has a skill set that the Ravens would utilize, um, but. I think third round would be where I would be targeting. Like that. I wouldn't take second, but you know, if he's there, the Ravens are picking 
third, I think I would be interested. All right, I'm gonna kind of go with a little bit of a homerism here with my number, let me make sure I have this right here. Yeah, my number seven guy, and that is uh, Ifitu Malfano of Syracuse, uh, 6220548. Uh, he's got that aircraft carrier size you love for the outside. You often hear me talk about that kind of thing. He did surrender a fair amount of yards per target, almost 8.0, 7.9 in 2020. That's not good enough for a pro prospect. Um, but you know what? He, what he's not doing at his size is just really weird. Uh, he has a brother, Obi, and they both have kind of the same prospects of not playing big. Uh, they're, they're, it, <laughs> Afitu is huge at 62205. He should be pressing, using that sideline, you know, demonstrating his ability to play outside corner in the NFL. He doesn't really do it. Played in a great Syracuse secondary that has two pro prospects at safety. Uh, Trill Williams, uh, who I really love, um, and Andre Sisco, who I also really love, would be great additions. Either one of them to the Ravens, if they, if they get, I'm, I'm going to be very excited about. Uh, but Belfano is a guy who who really should be able to use his size more ably at the college level. I don't really think he's um, he's done it. But that said, I also look for prospects which have a a big hole in their game where it shouldn't be, because that's often a correctable flaw. So I think in his case, it's a it's it's a chance the Ravens coaches will get to him and fix a guy who has some flaws as a cornerback. Yeah, I I, I mean, anytime you have that size, um, that size like combination, I think that's the thing that the Ravens really look for in the corners. Um, they have the combination of size and speed is something that really puts players on the map. And if you combine some skills with that, and um, I, I think he probably has them at least to a certain extent. I mean, it's there's a reason why he's not going to be considered a first round prospect. There's there's some deficiencies there. I think some of the maybe the, the short area is a little mm-hmm. questionable, but um I think there's there's definitely a lot of upside with a player like that. Mm-hmm. Be very excited if he dropped somehow to the end of the third round for the Ravens to pick him. I, I don't think he will, but if he did, I'd be very excited by it. That'd be that'd be it, it would excite me probably the way Matabike did last year in terms of being a guy that I think the Ravens got very cheap relative to his his value. All right, that's my number seven, guys. We're back to your number eight or whoever you want to talk about at this point. Yeah, so I guess I'll go more towards a more traditional cornerback who I think has some potential, but also might slide due to some uh, various concerns, and that's Kelvin Joseph mm-hmm. um, out of Kentucky, who has really um, impressive kind of physical talent, I would say. Um, he's got a good size. I think he's right under six foot. Um, ran, you know, sub 4-4-40. Four, four, um, he's got good length. I, th- I think he has the raw talent to be a very good NFL cornerback. Um, there's, you know, he, he was in the he did a transfer from LSU. I'm not sure all of the issues that were there, but mm-hmm. um, that's something that I'm sure, you know, NFL teams are going to investigate, like why players tend to do that sometimes. It's maturity. Sometimes it's you know um, exterior forces. Sometimes it's just you don't get along with the coach. Things like that. Um, but I think outside of that, when he's on the field, you know he's a good player. I mean, he, he can make plays. He had I think four picks last season, um, and and those are things that you know really stood out. And and, and he just has the, like the raw like coverage ability, like fluid hips, the ability to kind of like turn and and run ever find the ball. I think that's something that um, would be really beneficial in, in any Yeah, I, I I like him too, and he's in my top... Oh, let me get to tell you where he is. He's number 12 on my list. Um, so he's behind Aaron Robinson, but I still like him. I, I did not know the nature of his off-field issues. So the, the off-field issues, whatever they are, if they're some sort of domestic violence, I don't think the Ravens will take the chance. Um, if this is, uh, you know, this is a player who's perhaps the fastest man in the entire draft. I've seen 428 ascribed to him. And, uh, you know, it, that's, you got, you have to consider a player like that. What I don't like is that a guy who, who has that kind of speed can get beat four times and even give up 30 yards per game. Those, those aren't numbers. You wouldn't expect numbers that high from a corner with his kind of ability. Um, I, I, I look at his tape, and I don't see a guy who reads leverage exceptionally well. Uh, now, there's two potential sources of There's multiple potential sources, but let me give you the two big ones that I'm going I'm to talk about here. 
if you if you don't read tells well, I think that's something that you can adjust at the NFL level and get better at. If it's because you don't have the processing speed to do it, then it's going to be more of a problem because some of that just it's like being a boxer. If you react in 37 one thousandths of a second as opposed to 58 one thousandths of a second. Well, that's the difference between Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali in terms of quickness in there. I, I, you know, it, for a cornerback, it's the same kind of thing. And I don't really have a, a good sense of 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 whether it's processing speed or reading tells. And so they can improve to a certain point until they they, they reach that processing speed wall. So Kelvin Joseph may have it. He may not. He may have those, you know, very sharp, twitchy, you know, they call it muscle twitch, but I think it's really processing speed um, that it really comes down to. He may have it. He may not. I, I trust the Ravens to figure it out. Yeah. And I think when you get to this point in kind of the class cornerback, there's always, you know, there's some positives and there's some traits you can look for, especially like the obvious athletic traits. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when you, when you put on the film, there's, there's efficiency and there's reasons why the, these players are, are not considered yeah. higher because, you know, either they're lacking in their kind of up, upstairs, whether they're not, not processing, like you said, or, you know, maybe there's technique issues with their feet or maybe they're too grabby and they, and they like gamble, you know, there's a lot of potential things that are holding players back. Some of that is coachable. Some of that can be coached out. And, and that's why you do take athletes in the NFL because you can you know, kind of have like that, raw like putty or, or clay that you can mold into the player that you want. Um, but sometimes you're, you're just going to miss as well. When you take gambles with players like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and uh, I, I, it's, I, I just, I put that in the, in the, in the field of, I really trust the Ravens to figure it out. They've done a great job of drafting corners in the past. They've done a good job of drafting late corners, even though a hundred percent of them have not worked out, but, but to get Averett and Young as picks in the fourth round, I think are, are I wouldn't call each of them a home run, but you know, it's like a, a, a couple of doubles, yeah. I, you know, that they're, that are very successful in terms of, of, of where they were. Uh, my next guy is Tyson Campbell, the other Georgia cornerback. You probably got him on your list somewhere too. He's got the size of six one one ninety three. probably could bulk up a little bit. The good news is since he's starting at four thirty seven, I think he's a guy who can afford to get a little bit bigger and become a little bit more of a press disruptor, a sideline disruptor. Uh, he was beaten too often for my liking in 2020. He gave up five touchdowns. Uh, he allowed 162 yards in the game against Alabama. Had a 114 passer rating against for the year. That is not good stuff. It definitely isn't. You're buying the traits and you're trying to figure out with a player down here, probably near the bottom of the third round, uh, whether or not you want to take a gamble on him or not. If he drops in the fourth round, I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, in the third round, I think he'll probably be scooped up by some team. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. And I think it's a similar conversation that, that we just had with Joseph. And it's so the physical traits are, are there in spades, but for some reason, he didn't put it together in college. I think he was like a very high uh, recruited player, well, uh, Campbell was. And, you know, he didn't necessarily have the production that you want for somebody with the physical gift that he has. Um, he also got flagged for a lot of penalties. Um, something mm-hmm. that I noticed with him is someone technique might not be there. I think maybe it's kind of a, a panic kind of thing. You know, you know you're, you're getting Grabby. beat or you know you're about to get beat, grab. Um, in college, that's not quite the worst thing in the world, especially if you're going to give up a long completion. It's more problematic in the NFL um, the, the way the, the pass experience um, so I think he's someone who would be better at, um, understanding routes, understanding, um, like leverage that like you mentioned before, and then being able to find the ball. I think that's something that he really struggled with as well. Um, you know, he, he only has one career interception and someone who has that pedigree, you think would be a little productive side of things. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, uh, who's your next guy? Um, or just gonna, at this point, anybody yeah, you'd like yeah, to yeah. talk so about? I, I think there's uh, Michigan State, Shakur Brown. Mm-hmm. Um, he has, he's kind of the opposite, <laughs> I would say, of some of the past couple players that you talked about. He doesn't have the athletic. Um, he's another 4'6", 40 guy. Um, he doesn't have the size. He's just under 5'10". Um, but he, he was a playmaker for, for, the, for Michigan State this past year. He had five interceptions. I think he had another one called back because of a penalty. Um, you know, he, I don't want to say Ed Reed because that's 
really high praise, but he just mm-hmm. has like this instinct and knack for finding the football, the knack for making plays. Um, and he's someone who's probably going to be there fourth, fifth round. Um, that's someone who I'm interested in that has that kind of mental um, knowledge, the ability to be instinctual, know how to be in the right place and to do things when given the opportunity. I, I have him on my list of evaluation here, but I didn't have him anywhere near my top 12. I, I think, and, and I mean, you probably don't either. I have him as a sixth round or later guy. It's a guy I would not mind the Ravens taking a flyer on. Uh, he's definitely not on the efficient frontier of size and, size and speed. Let's start with right. that at 5'10", 185, and he runs a 460, 140. You're way off on the on the on the blue on the chart somewhere. Uh, not not in a good spot. Meaning, um, I liked uh, some of the ability to mirror, but I didn't. I didn't think the agility metrics really um, matched up with that. And when I see that, then I'm I'm concerned about will that really translate to the next level, or will the receivers just be too damn good in terms of giving him the false signal and allowing him to to match with that? Uh, it, it, not a terrible choice if the Ravens if the UDFA absolutely love to have him. I'd be one of the first people I'd call if they spent a six on him. No problem. If they spent a four on him, I probably that's not something i'd want to see yeah i i, I think for me he's probably the five like the five range um that's probably where i would start looking at it. um i think the athleticism is probably what's going to hold him back and he might even slip further than that because that size and he for someone who is size you would expect a little bit more like quickness especially in the ability testing and it just wasn't there for him right um so that that might plummet his draft stock but just the playmaking ability if you get him mid round um the late rounds, I should say. I think that's something that, that's interesting. All right. Anybody else you want to talk about? Or you another player or two? Um, yeah, so I think there's there's a guy, um, high State cornerback Sean Wade. Um, okay. I, he's someone who maybe um, is, get him in the same range. I think maybe fifth round. Um, he has better physical t- traits, I think. Um, he's got good size. Um, he got beat a lot, though. Um, and that's not something that you would like to see, but I think the potential with him is is there. Um, I think he has some kind of laziness at times on the field, and, and that's something that I wouldn't want to be um, known by if I was a cornerback, especially considering how NFL scouts look at these players. <laughs> Um, but I, I tend to see that he's not completely like involved all the time, but when he is locked in, I think he can be a good cornerback. Um, and if some of those issues make him fall, he could potentially be a late round, uh, deal. All right. That's a, that's a fair enough one. Did not, I did not evaluate him, so I'm not going to try and render an opinion on him right now. I, I'll toss in a guy I did evaluate, and that's, uh, Benjamin Sanchesti of Minnesota, uh, a, a guy who I think is on a lot of people's radar just because of how unique a, a, a caddy is. 63202. A 45540 is not special, but that length and size is way out there. And it's definitely on the efficient frontier, largely because there's nobody else at his uh, height and length. So it's so you can't help but have have the, have the best 40 time in that group if you're if you're uh, out there. Uh, he has excellent three cone and shuttle metrics. But if you look at his tape, he's definitely not a quick reader. So he's, he doesn't have that same um, anticipation, that ability to read opponent leverage. Uh, I think he's a developmental prospect. I think he has a very high upside potentially as an outside corner. Uh, could be a, a guy that, like Ike Taylor, like Jimmy Smith, becomes a guy who just masters the use of that sideline, doesn't allow himself to be really easily stacked, and has enough speed to get you by out there uh, on, on most plays. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if where where teams are willing to take a, a risk on him. But you know, I wouldn't have a problem with the Ravens taking him in sometime on early on day three yeah i mean i think like we've talked about that size that speed combo that's something that it's pretty rare especially if you can get it later in the draft um and, and if you can just coach up um with some of the skills um you know there might be some of like the the other other areas you can work on and and if you can you can get him like you said learn how to 
for asset line scrimmage, use the use the sideline to your advantage. Um, that can be something that is another player that really develop for you. I think as a, as more of a developmental player at that point in the draft, you know, you're hoping that um, it's maybe not in the first couple years, but year three he might come out and, and be someone who can be at, at least like a, a third or fourth cornerback for you. Yeah, I mean, he's, he'd be a special teams guy and he'd be he'd be a cornerback that the Ravens would not need again in 2021, but they then have maybe something that's pretty special a year later. So they can afford certainly to take a late gamble on a player like that. One other thing I wanted to say about him was the 32 and 5 eighths inches on his arms. And I'll say right now, we're going to talk about the interior offensive line to get to <laughs> tomorrow night. I already talked about the offensive tackles in a previous show. There's a bunch of offensive tackles currently in this draft who would be a better chance to stick at offensive tackle if they just had his arm length. And, you know, he's 6'3", but there's a bunch of guys who are, who are frankly, they're just not going to make it at, in the NFL at tackle because they're, they're down in the 32-inch arm range. And that, you know, an extra half inch, an extra quarter of an inch even in some of these cases would have been enough that, that, uh, that, that they had to have a better chance to stick at tackle. It does seem to be a strange phenomenon, specifically in the offensive tackle class mm-hmm. of this draft, that the arm length is just... Very short. It's short. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why that's the case. Yeah. And but. that's... Some of the some of the pure metrics guys are out there because that I think part of it might be Gabe that that there are not all the small school offensive tackle prospects because nobody really knows, uh, you know. So so you don't have a Gregory Sonat from Wagner because he didn't he wouldn't have played this year, and you know a, a big guy like that who has good feet, basketball background, you know, has otherwise some left track left tackle or bust characteristics isn't there for the for the taking but yeah i agree it's it, the size and shape positions have really suffered in this draft in general yeah um I, so i have i have two more names that i wanted to talk about and one of them is someone who was mentioned in twitter conversation that we had and that's um carrie vincent jr of lsu mm-hmm. so he is another player who took off the 2020 year um with which is strange because i don't think he was going to be someone projected to be like a top draft pick um but you know decided to not to play opt out of the season he's on the smaller side but he has a very good speed um sub four four um he's a track star going back to high school mm-hmm. so um the speed is definitely there um you know he has some playmaking he, i mean he was obviously a good player on the lsu you know championship team um he made with patrick Green. um mostly played in the slot, played a little bit of safety, but I think, you know, if you're looking at traits, I mean, I mean, the size is on the underside, but he has the speed, um, he has some playmaking ability. The one thing that I couldn't get by with him was he could not turn around and find the ball to save his life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he always just, like, stared at the receiver. He, he could not, I mean, if he's facing the quarterback, he can make a play on the ball, but if he's running with the receiver, he's just going to try and try and run through the receiver basically and, and time it well he's a little short with the arm um and that's something that i think could affect him but he's more than willing to, l- to lay a big hit as someone his size i think interesting and like does stick with that ground right and you see him as a slot guy in, yeah. in the nfl 100%. Yeah. yeah that's that's uh that's good but the the off ball skills that you mention are only really useful on the are, are more useful on the yeah. outside um it's it's he'd, he'd be a gamble um, I, I kind of hope the Ravens could get him late, whether that means a six, whether that means even they get him as a UDFA. He probably gets drafted just because of lots of things, uh, but uh, but not necessarily. Uh, I think we've named everybody on my list. I didn't talk about Ambry Thomas, but we don't need to. He's number 12 on my list. Do you have another guy you want to talk about? One more guy, and this is probably, you know, seventh round pick, maybe undrafted free agent. Hmm. His name is Avery Williams. Uh, played at Boise State, and he was a starting cornerback for them. But he, he's very undersized. Although he has decent speed, four four speed, um, he's only five foot eight. So that's limited in terms of his cornerback. But he is a mm-hmm. dynamic special player, not just as a returner, but on the kick block, amazing stuff. Um, I would I'd recommend just looking up clips if you're interested in special team. I think he's someone who can come in and be a special team star for pretty much any team that, that that's interested in or needs that, both um, in coverage and in, in like the, the kick block. He has the ability to get after the kicker off the edge. Really impressive. Hmm. 
that's that is a little unusual. So he probably has really good snap mechanics understanding. He's probably watching the center on those plays like Ed Reed used to on punt blocks. Uh, that I, I I would put a value on that. I, I've been talking on recent shows about how I think the value of kick coverage has been reduced in the NFL uh, because of the way the game is played now. And so I don't think you can just just do that. So if this guy is a potential return guy, maybe that would be interesting. If this guy is a is a guy who can at least contribute on defense, I think that's kind of the minimum you'd have to get out of him. I don't think you can get by with not playing any defense and just being a specialist. Yeah, I think he could be competitive in the slot. I mean, the size limitations are there, but he has the speed to mm-hmm. to, to you know hold up there. I think so. You know, there was some talk about him. I think actually maybe looking at being a running back in the NFL. Um, because he was a running back in high school. I think he might have even done some snaps in college running back. Um, but, you know, he has the speed for it. He has the, the quickness, I think. Um, it's kind of the same size as, like, a Justice Hill, maybe a little lighter. But, um, you know, th- there's different things you could potentially do with a player like that. And if, and if you have a draft pick at the end of the, of the, of the, the draft and maybe you didn't take a cornerback, maybe you need to help out your special teams room, I think he's someone that take a look at. All right. All right. Outstanding stuff, Gabe. Uh, let's tell folks where they can find your stuff again. Yeah. So um, you can find me on Twitter at Gabe Berkey. Um, you know, it's been a bit of a quiet time, even though it's draft season, I haven't had quite the opportunity to dig in as much as I normally do. Um, but it's, I think as we get closer to the draft, I'll probably start tweeting a little bit more fervently about some of the players that are catching my eye. Um, I'm posting the Situation Room with Jordan Co. Um, we have just recorded the offensive side. I think we're going to try to record something about the defense side next week. So we'll have those coming up as we get closer to the draft. And then I think once the draft comes around, we're going to try to have something kind of summarizing how we feel about the draft as well. So um, look forward to talking about that. And um, I'm sure that, you know, as we get closer to the the real offseason and the, the regular regular NFL, There'll be a lot more coming out. Okay. Raven Situation Room, a post on filmstudybaltimore.com. Make sure you give that that show a shot. Add it to your to your downloads, and I, you will not be disappointed. This is two very smart guys talking about football, and uh, they're very knowledgeable, and, and they get into it in an in a interesting and engaging way, and I'd highly recommend it. Uh, for other folks, uh, we've got a lot of draft content out there. I'd, I'd encourage people to go back and, and listen to the Brad Spielberg, Spielberger um, podcast, which came out on Friday and was talking to Brad about, he works for PFF, about the Fitzgerald Spielberger method of draft valuation, which creates a much flatter valuation of draft picks. Uh, you don't have to completely agree with it in order to understand that he's, he has a different perspective on it, a different set of rules for evaluating that, which is very interesting. I think he does a good job of articulating that, uh, getting de- into the methodology in a way, and then talking about, about teams like the Ravens and uh, some interesting things they've done with, with the relative uh, valuation of age, cap, and war. Uh, as as uh, uh, calculated by PFF standards. So uh, interesting what to do. Gabe, thanks again for joining us tonight for this one. Yeah, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. We'll talk to you next time on Film Study. Uh-huh.